Okay, I will, <laughs> I will speak louder. Um, the next presentation is going to be by Lea von Moos, who is a doctoral student with uh, Professor Zimmermann at the uh, Laboratory of Food and Nutrition, Nutrition Toxicology or, and in the Department of Health Science and Technology at the ETH Zurich. She is going to talk about toxicity of iron phosphate nanoparticles in the digestive tract. I'm yes. anxious to hear something about that, to learn some new things. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to give this presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about the safety of iron phosphate nanoparticles that could be used for food applications. And first, I would like to say that this is actually a collaboration between three different laboratories at ETH. So it originated at the Human Nutrition Lab of Professor Zimmerman. It's a collaboration between the Particle Technology Lab of Professor Pratzinis and the lab of Professor Shanna Sterler, where I'm also part of the Food and Nutrition Toxicology Lab. And this scheme kind of guides you through the presentation. So in the upper right corner, you always see kind of in which part um, or in which expertise um, um, this part is involved. So why are we interested in putting iron phosphate nanoparticles into foods? So this is because iron deficiency is still the most common micronutrient deficiency worldwide. And one efficient way to combat or prevent iron deficiency is by food fortification with iron. However, it's not so easy to put iron into food because on one hand we have the water soluble compounds like iron sulfate, which are taken up well by the body, but usually they tend to cause color changes in the food. That's why the food industry prefers less reactive substances like, for example, um, ferric phosphate. But the problem there is that they are not taken up well by the body. And now the group of Professor Zimmermann could actually show that iron from nanostructured iron phosphate um, particles is taken up well by the body without inducing color changes in foods. And so the hypothesis how this works is that actually the nanoparticles enter the stomach. Due to the low pH, they fully dissolve and um, the ions are taken up via the normal iron uptake pathway shown here. But the question remains, what happens if not all particles are dissolved and enter the intestine, where they will interact with the mucus layer of the intestine? intestine? And then there are two options. So either through the renewal of this mucus layer, the particles are actually excreted, or they can actually penetrate it and are, can interact with the underlying epithelial. And then the question is, could this induce any um, adverse effects? And in my part, um, we are mainly um, investigating oxidative stress and cell, vi cell viability. And today I'm going to talk about um, the cell viability experiments that we did in the past. So the particles um, that we use are actually produced by the same way like um, Inge Hermann introduced before, so by flame spray pyrolysis. Um, by actually by adjusting the flame, we produced two differently sized iron phosphate nanoparticles, so one with a surface a larger as one with a surface area of 100 square meter per gram that corresponds to an average particle diameter of 20 nanometers, and a smaller particle with a surface area of 190 corresponding to a primary particle size of about 10 nanometers. As control particles for our um, studies, we include um, silica particles that are actually food grade and they've been used in food since about 40 years. There we also use um, two differently sized uh, particles, one with a surface area of 200 and one with 380. And as iron control we use iron sulfate and a larger iron phosphate with a surface area of 23 that's al also um, commercially available and food grade. Um, for the particle characteristics, so here you see the calculated primary particle, which ranges from, let's say, 10 to 20 for the phosphates and 6 to 11 for the silica particles. However, when we put them in water, they 
agglomerate really heavily. This is due um, to the low surface charge, as you can see here. Um, so that's why we tried to disperse them as well as possible through sonication. And so the best that we could reach was agglomerates of around 200 to 300 nanometers. So we did not manage to get um, smaller agglomerates. And then, of course, we wanted to see if these um, agglomerates are also stable over time. So during the duration of our in vitro experiments, which last 72 hours, you can see that actually the average agglomerate size is stable and does not change. Um, so now the question is, these are quite large agglomerates. Are these able to introduce toxicity and are they even taken up by the cells? Um, so for our in vitro system, we have three different intestinal cell lines. So the HG29 cells are cancer-derived colon cells. Then we have a subclone of these HD29 cells, the antique cells. They produce mucus. And by comparing these two cell lines, we would like to see whether the mucus has an effect on the potential effect of the nanoparticles on the cells. And then a third cell line, we have the so-called HCEC cells, which are immortalized colon cells derived from non-cancerous tissue. And for us, they serve as a more normal um, cell compared to the cancer cells. So what we do is we disperse our particles in full media. We expose the cells for 24 or 48 hours to the nanoparticles and then assess um, membrane integrity, metabolic activity, and cellular uptake. Um, so for the membrane integrity, so this will be quite a busy slide. So here you have the three different cell lines. Um, here on the y-axis is the membrane integrity um, relative to untreated cells. In blue are our two iron phosphate nanoparticles, and in green are the silica particles that we use as control. And these are increasing concentrations of nanoparticles, always um, standardized on the surface area. And what you can see is actually no effect, so the membrane integrity was not um, affected by the particles. When compared to the other um, iron controls, you can see that also for these two cancer cell lines, we did not see any effect. We only saw a small decrease in membrane integrity when exposed to this um, iron phosphate with a surface area of 23, so the commercial iron phosphate. Then for the metabolic activity, the picture is quite similar. So we see a slight reduction in only in cell viability in this HCC cell line, but not below 80% viability compared to untreated cells. And when we compare it to the other commercially available iron compounds, you can actually see that the reduction I, um, of the, the reduction in metabolic activity when exposed to this iron phosphate 23 is um, higher than when exposed to our iron phosphate nanoparticles. And one possible explanation for this could actually be that this um, iron phosphate 23 um, forms bigger agglomerates in the cell culture medium. That also means that it sediments faster on the bottom of the cell. So the cell actually sees more and faster um, of this iron compound, then it gets exposed to the iron phosphate nanoparticles. So this could be one explanation why this the viability is more reduced here. But this is something that we are working on right now. And then for the cellular uptake, um, so we expose the cells for 48 hours to the nanoparticles. And what we saw is that in a few cells, these particles are actually taken up as, co as large agglomerates. We do not know whether they're taken up as these large agglomerates or whether they're ta taken up as smaller agglomerates and then fused together to a bigger agglomerate inside the cell. Um, the same was true in the other cell line, um, but this was o we only did it with one compound so far, and what we would like to do is actually to quantify the amount of iron that's taken up by the cells by atomic absorption spectroscopy. So as a summary, we can say that the exposure of the um, cells to these nanoparticles 
did not really negatively affect the membrane integrity or the metabolic activity. However, now we would like to go further and see whether they might induce oxidative stress or can activate um, the immune system. And for the cell uptake, um, yes, they're taken up. However, we do not, um, we would like also to compare them to the control compounds and also to quantify how much is actually taken up. And then as last part of our study, we'll, we will also do an in vivo study where we will feed the animals um, for three months with a diet that's fortified with uh, nanoparticles and then assess biomarkers of toxicity. But so far we do not see anything, but as mentioned before, it's quite hard to prove that there's no effect. And with this, I would like to thank the, all the labs that are involved from my lab, especially Professor Stola, Dr. Trantakis and Miriam Schneider, and the NRP64 for the funding. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm late, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lea von Moos, for an interesting and, again, a very important uh, presentation. I think we have to learn more about nanoparticles in food, <laughs> except for those we use since 40 years, as you yes. say. <laughs> um, are there questions? Yes, please. And please do identify yourself. Hi, um, oh, I'm Tabor from Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, you said that the iron nanotube did not affect the membrane integrity af after 48 hours. Um, do you think if you had a long e exposure time, they'd have an effect or? I don't think so. Um, they're not tubes, they're actually spherical particles. So, I mean, because you incubated 48 hours? Yes. Did you? But, um, yeah, I don't know if a longer exposure could affect, but, I mean, technically, if it's in the gastrointestinal tract, I mean, the, the surface of the gastrointestinal tract is renewed within 24 hours, so I don't think that there's even the chance for these kind of cells to be exposed much more than 48 hours. Thank you. But we haven't tested it. Yeah, question in front. Hello, my, wife is, uh, my name is Ralf Dümpelmann from INET Innovation Networks, so a public innovation funding here in Basel. I was wondering what happens with the nanoparticles in the stomach at low pH because um, they're in which kind of conditions you did the experiment, yeah. probably not as pH one or so. No, no, so the hypothesis is that they actually fully dissolve in the stomach. Um, but, of course, if a certain amount of people take, for example, acid blockers, in this population the particles will probably not dissolve and also maybe due to some other um, pathological states that, I don't know, maybe not, the pH doesn't go as low as one or two, so maybe not everything dissolves, but it technically in a healthy, sub a healthy person um, the particles should be fully dissolved. So what we do is kind of a worst case scenario if the particles come in the digestive tract as they are, are like, like from production. But another thing that we would like to do is a simulated digestion to see the dissolution of the particle, for example, also how the, the size changes of the agglomerates, but that's also ongoing research. Yeah, thank you. Reinhard Zellner. That would have been my question also. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is there another question? I wonder, uh, as far as the size is concerned, mm -hmm. you know, we are talking about nanoparticles below 100 nanometers. However, this is a physical, chemical definition. It's not a biological one. Nanoparticles or particles of a size up to approximately 500 nanometers are dealt with by cells in a special way. They may enter more easily cells as larger particles do. Even if energy is involved, like through endocytosis, and in addition, they may enter cells without any energy input passively. That has been shown that's possible. 
Now, your nanoparticles are some, at least, if I read your uh, um, uh, tables correctly, are above 500 nanometers. So they would probably be dealt with by cells as micron-sized particles. Mm -hmm. So you lose with that all the specific um, uh, um, uh, things sort of in the behavior uh, of, of particles which interact with cells. Mm -hmm. what, what can you say to this? Um, maybe if I can just quickly go back sure. to the table. Sorry. Because actually it's... Um, I mean, just those transmission yes. electron micrograms, they just uh, They're really large. Then, yeah, but if you see here what we have, what we feed to the cells, I mean, our s nanoparticles are between two and 400, and our control is the micron size. This is around 600. Oh, it's okay. So, so it's borderline. It's borderline, <laughs> definitely. However, I would say those which are 200 mm -hmm. and something, they could be biologically considered as nanoparticles mm -hmm. interacting with biological systems mm -hmm. in a very specific way, which is different from particles which are larger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, this is also a nice comparison actually between our particles that are technically composed of the same as this iron phosphate that's larger like as a micron particle. So to see a size yeah. effect. Yeah, you you may lose lots of effects if you deal with larger particles. Yeah. The cell doesn't behave the same way and may not react the same way. It yeah. may react more effectively or may not react at all. Yeah. It's, it really depends. One has to look into that case by case. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much again.